bright and breezy, free and easy, went the song. And in many ways, the same can be said of Blackpool today. As town histories go, Blackpool's is short but hectic. Most of what is now a thriving town, attracting almost 10 million visitors a year, was just 100 years before these were taken, a bleak salt marsh with just a few scattered dwellings and the occasional public house. This group of 20s fun seekers arrive at the Pleasure Beach after a short ride on an early open tram. By the 1920s, when these scenes were taken, Blackpool had reached new fame and popularity. By train and by charabang, the working people of the mill towns of Lancashire would descend on the town for a week of fun and frolics by the sea. The Pleasure Beach itself grew up piecemeal upon the South Shore sand dunes surrounding the original Star Inn at the area now known as Star Gate, once a bleak and inhospitable place inhabited only by a large and well-settled gypsy encampment. The hardy band of revellers takes a ride on the water chute, an early version of the log flume. The precarious wooden boats would rattle down rickety rails to splash into a man-made lake. Each boat is tended by a uniformed gondolier, whose job is to punt the revellers back to the start of the ride. The water chute was one of several original rides dismantled when the Blackpool Corporation rerouted local roads largely curtailing the park's expansion southward. Other rides briefly glimpsed are the Scenic Railway and the Rainbow Wheel, both now dismantled. This spinning centrifuge ride was known as the Joy Wheel, in its day described as the craziest device which ever escaped from America. A ride very similar to this was savoured until just a few years ago, when unfortunately it and the whole of the much-loved Fun House was destroyed in a fire. A few shots of the early Big Dipper. The original wooden roller coasters are still a feature of the Pleasure Beach today, but with space at a premium, the park's owners have never been slow to replace older attractions with higher, faster and even more head-spinning novelties. The Big Dipper had already been preceded by rides such as the Hotchkiss Bicycle Railway, the Switchback Railway and the Velvet Coaster.
passengers are seen here embarking rather precariously on a boat ride. The boats, which were pulled along by chains just under the surface of the water, survived in a similar form until quite recently as the Tom Sawyer raft ride. The Pleasure Beach is still by far the biggest draw in Blackpool. Still privately owned, it celebrated its centenary in 1996. The open-air bathing pool at South Shore was built in the 1920s, modelled, it's said, on the Colosseum in Rome. In its day, it was the largest open-air pool anywhere in the world. It proved immensely popular with bathers, attracting four million customers in its first six years. The pool was even featured in a number of feature films, most notable the Gracie Fields classic Sing As We Go. Sadly, attendances started to fall in the 60s and 70s, despite being the venue for the Miss United Kingdom beauty competition for many years. Valiant attempts to revitalise the area, including a plan to roof over the entire structure, came to nothing, and the South Shore Pool finally closed in 1983, to be replaced by the modern and now equally popular Sandcastle Centre. Crowds gather to sing and be entertained by the hits of the day. Sadly, no soundtrack survives, but everybody seems to be joining in. Chairs bear the name of music publishers Feldman's. Dancing in the open air is something rarely witnessed today, but in the 20s and 30s it was seen as a great way to pass the afternoon, whatever the weather. Judging from the hats and coats, these shots of promenading holidaymakers at South Shore must have been taken in late season.
The ornamental gardens at South Shore would have been a new feature at the time this film was taken. Much of the promenade had been remodelled following the renewal of the sea defences, an ongoing task that still continues today. In fact, the erosion of the coast had been a constant problem for hundreds of years. The ancient village of Kilgrimol is said to lie almost a mile out to sea, having been lost to erosion and the sea centuries before. This view of North Shore, looking south from Ginn Square, shows the crumbling earth cliffs, which were soon to be replaced by more permanent concrete defences. North Shore Boating Pool was a popular attraction right up until the 70s, its high walls making it a sheltered, safe sun trap. Stanley Park, then written as the new park, was completed in 1926 and officially opened by the Earl of Derby. Designed and constructed by the Lancaster firm of Thomas Henry Mawson, the park cost the authority almost a quarter of a million pounds. The new park, partly built on the site of the town's first airfield, replaced the nearby Rakes Hall Royal Palace Gardens, which had been a major attraction but was largely built over with houses during the 20s and 30s. Stanley Park remains largely unchanged, a peaceful oasis amongst the razzmatazz, enjoyed equally by locals, sand gronans, and visitors, grockles. Only the height of the trees, in these scenes newly planted, has really changed. Progress has always been the motto of the town, and these scenes, taken in the 1940s, seem a world away from those of just 20 years before.
much of the modern street pattern seems to have been well established. Work on building Blackpool's famous tower began in 1891, just two years after the world had been amazed by Gustav Eiffel's famous erection for the Paris exhibition. It was planned as one of a chain of towers to be built in seaside resorts around Britain. This view of South Shore from South Pier is very different, with the sign now dominated by the giant modern rides of the Pleasure Beach. Back at the North Shore, the boating pool was still attracting the crowds. Sadly, this area has now largely fallen into disrepair and disuse. Attempts at revitalizing the pool in recent years have floundered, and it now lies a drained and somewhat sorry sight. In the early 50s, an ambitious widescreen film, Playground Spectacular, was produced to extol the virtues of Blackpool to cinema audiences across the country. Playground spectacular, playground extraordinary. Blackpool, known to millions of Britons and millions from overseas. Hundreds of special trains bring thousands of people daily to this mecca of pleasure. Motor vehicles flow along the wide motor roads at the rate of 3,000 an hour. Coaches carry 3 million passengers each year, and each season 8 million arrive to experience the delights of this northern wonderland. Linking the seven miles of coastline between the northern and southern boundaries, sleek rail cars run the entire length of the most impressive promenade in the world. Separating the streamlined car track from these broad promenades are magnificent carriageways. On 36 miles of track, almost three and a half million miles a year are covered. In 1884, the first electric tramway in Great Britain was inaugurated here. Soon it will be the last city to provide this form of transport. As others dispose of their fleets, Blackpool adds new types, whilst perpetuating the memory of the trams of yesteryear by bringing these veterans out of retirement to mark the 75th anniversary of the system. The horse-drawn cab provides variety for those who wish to get about each day in a different way. The metropolitan aspect of the town is in direct contrast with the seaside amenities. Heavy traffic moves through the thoroughfares transporting residents and visitors on business or pleasure. 
police control has to be exercised with tolerance and skill. Shopping centres provide everything that could be desired. This is Market Street. With the town hall flanking one side, Talbot Square is Blackpool's Piccadilly Circus. Church Street, a through way to the sea. Abington Street, the windows of its stores packed with merchandise of every kind. The duties of the police force here are much more than in any other town. Chief Constable Henry Edward Sanders holds daily conferences to ensure that problems of every possible kind are solved with the minimum of delay and the maximum of efficiency. holding hands, or rather, holding tails. Another kind of slow traffic moves across the promenade, the circus elephants taking their daily exercise. Still running round in circles, the horses do their daily dozen on the beach. certainly enough water for their bath and they enjoyed it thoroughly. Children playing happily on a crowded beach are apt to get mislaid. Tiny ones with no sense of direction can't find their way back to the family. Very soon one of the lost children's centres has them under its care and mummy knows exactly where to go and the happy reunion takes place. No less than three pairs cater for those who feel the need for a different one each day. Theatres, sun lounges and orchestras are to be found on all of them. The largest of the three is the North Pier, 710 yards in length including the jetty. Thousands stroll here each day, thousands more relax in the sunshine. The jetty runs from the end of the pier out into the sea. Experienced and not so experienced anglers reap the harvest. Not such a good harvest this year. To weigh up any situation, there are always the scales. She's eager to know the result. Couldn't possibly tell you what she said. The telescope always brings things a little nearer. Yes, this must be the place that thought of the word togetherness. And how together can you get? is called the Golden Mile, certainly not because of its length, which is only a quarter of a mile, but because of the money that's spent here. It's a kaleidoscope of sideshows, hot dog stands and all the fun of the fair.
There's no moral to this picture. It's just a new inmate being carried to his position in the waxworks. To get away from it all, you go south, where the promenades and beaches can be just what the doctor ordered for peace and quiet. You can also go north and find tranquility. The golden beaches stretch away into the distance. of this Lancashire resort can be traced back no more than 300 years. At that time, it was no more than a cluster of cottages. Today, a resort known to millions all over the world. Its contrasts of crowds and emptiness, of high-spirited fun and tranquility are really amazing. Catering is on a gigantic scale. Chefs have to have an unsurpassed know-how when it comes to meal times. Meat and fish are eaten at the rate of 500 and 100 tons respectively each week. Filtered seawater fills the open air bath. There's plenty of space for the 7,000 bathers who come here daily. Former British heavyweight Brian London is a prized Blackpool resident. Brian delivers the punchline and what a line. From all over the British Isles, feminine beauty parades here in a weekly competition to find the most beautiful girl amongst them. Well, here are a few of them for you to give the once over. Yes, the ladies can watch too, but as the competition is judged by a man, the final say will be with him. BBC personality Barney Colohan is the man of the moment. Hope he makes the right decision. So let battle commence. Form, elegance, grace, refinement, charm, style, and comeliness are what the judge is looking for. Well, anyway, that's what he says. The winner of the Miss Blackpool title could go forward to the Miss World contest. He should be in What's My Line. Looks a pretty shrewd judge to me. They have their own ideas. Well, he made his mind up and the decision is really final. But did he do right by the girls? The winner, and boy, has he made her happy. From starry-eyed maidens to lights of another kind, all through the year work goes on for the great day in September. Fabulous illuminations will be switched on.
From one end to the other, the promenades will be a blaze of light. 75 miles of cable will be laid, 350,000 coloured lamps will dance and glow in the annual display of dazzling splendour. Mr Blackpool, Reginald Dixon, gives recitals in the ballroom. The idol of millions, he's played to audiences here for 30 years. In the tower bar, the finest methods of interior decoration have been applied. Mirrors brilliantly cut and embossed create sparkle, contrasting with the lines of the gold and ebonized wood columns. Following a disastrous fire in 1956, the tower ball was restored at a cost of half a million pounds. Magnificent ceiling murals occupy an area of over 2,000 square feet. <music> 2,500 people can take the floor at the same time. 4,000 others can watch them. <music> the Tower Circus is internationally famous. As clever as a cartload of monkeys, this box of chimpanzees is the bring the house down part of the show. Everyone relaxes before curtain up. Charlie Corelli, almost a fixture here at this circus, puts the finishing touches to his makeup. The show begins at the circus, which is now the only permanent one of its kind in the country. spectacles complete the show when the ring is lowered and the arena flooded with thousands of gallons of water. Water too plays its part in the fountains of Stanley Park with its formal gardens, colourful herbaceous borders and sporting facilities. The park is an outstanding attraction. Tennis courts, boating lakes, bowling greens and cricket pitches for inter-county matches are all to hand for those of an athletic turn of mind. One of the fine municipal golf courses, one can find golfers of a first-class calibre. Did I say first-class calibre? Never mind, he's a first-class comedian.
The conservatories contain a wonderful collection of tropical and popular plants. Apart from the exhibition of exotic specimens, the houses provide an enormous quantity of bedding out material. The Pleasure Beach of Playground Spectacular contains amusement devices, most of which are of basic American design. Spacious and magnificently planned, it's a rip-roaring, rixing revelry. Double track racing coaster, 3,000 feet in length with cars traveling at 30 miles an hour, guarantees a thrill of thrills. Let's go! The notice shows the way out. It's the way out for us too. Out of the ever open door to Playground Spectacular. By the 1960s, things had progressed yet again. The much-missed Palace Ballroom and Alhambra Entertainment Centre were coming down to be replaced by the rising star of leisure time, the shopping centre. In this case, the new Lewis's store, right next to the tower on the central promenade, replaced the Alhambra, which along with Matcham's Winter Gardens and the Grand Theatre, was one of the great architectural gems of the town. The tower frontage, shown here in its somewhat gaudy 60s incarnation, has since been restored to something a little closer to its Victorian roots. In the 60s, the ramshackle and informal cluster of huts, stalls and chalets that were the essential golden mile still existed. Although a little of this casual planning anarchy still survives, much of the art has been redeveloped into sophisticated amusement complexes by the large multinational leisure corporations that now control most of the town. Viewed from the tower lift, the contour of the promenade has changed yet again to accommodate the ever necessary sea defences.
open-air dancing continued to be popular, at least with the girls, right up until the early 60s. Dancing on the pier was a Blackpool institution. Even as far back as 1895, screens had been erected off pier to shield the dancers from the strong sea breezes. It's 40 years on from our previous view of the South Shore bathing pool. Here, the popular comedians Eric Morecambe and Ernie Wise are guest judges of the 1963 Miss Blackpool competition. The Blackpool trams are famous the world over, but they're more than just a tourist attraction. The trams run every day throughout the whole year and are a part of the town's public transport system for locals and visitors alike. The first trams were operated by the Blackpool Electric Tramway Company in 1885. Unlike the modern trams, which take their power from an overhead electric wire, the early trams were powered by a troublesome underground conduit system. The first trams were modelled on those of the Manx Electric Railway, just across the sea on the Isle of Man. Although the track is presently limited to a narrow strip up and down the promenade, at one time the trams crisscrossed the town and out into the suburbs, with tracks ferrying people inland to Oxford Square, Whitegate Drive and even Leighton. Along with the trams, the tower and the pleasure beach, Blackpool's fourth world-famous attraction has to be the Illuminations. Shining between the end of August and the start of November, they bring thousands of visitors into the town at a time of year when other resorts have packed up for the winter. Even in the mid-50s, there were said to be over 300,000 separate lamps and over 75 miles of cable. The lights have always had a grand ceremonial switch on. Great names from stage and screen have been invited to push the magic button. Les Dawson, Diana Dawes, Violet Carson, a longtime Blackpool resident herself, have been joined by Americans such as Jane Mansfield and the ambassador John Hay Whitney, who compared them favorably to the Great White Way of Broadway. Bigger, better, brighter, higher, faster. Blackpool thrives on superlatives, or at least the promise of them. Giving the people just what they wanted, whatever that might be, has always been the root of Blackpool's success and the cause of disdain amongst those of more highbrow taste. Mawson, the great architect of Stanley Park, once recalled a meeting with an old gentleman of Blackpool who philosophized, men stick work as long as and once a year they must either burst or go to Blackpool. And after a fortnight turn, quietened down and ready for work again, Blackpool stands between us and revolution. <laughs>